gentle marketers. Welcome to episode 72 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm and changing it to a gentler approach, one that's based on empathy and kindness. As always, I'm Sarah Zanacroce, I'm the host on this show, and you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business that is aligned with your values. You might also be a marketing impact pioneer, so that's someone who's working in an organization who does business for good. Today's episode falls under the P of Promotion. If you're a regular here, I'm so glad you're here. You know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of the gentle marketing mandala. And if you're new here and don't know what I'm talking about, you can download your one page marketing plan with the gentle marketing version of the seven P's of marketing at sarasenacroce.com forward slash one page. That's the number one and then the word page. It comes with seven email prompts to really help you reflect on these different P's. So today, promotion. You know, now that I think about it, I don't really like the word promotion. It reminds me of another word that is publicity. It's another P word. But that's not really what we're focusing on under this P. What really falls under the P of promotion is finding a way and a platform to let others engage with you. And yeah, also let them know about you, who you are, what you stand for, And of course, what you're good at and what you offer, that to me is promotion. So on one hand, it is, yes, about promoting something, your services or your products, but it's much more than that. It's really an engagement with your people. And it's also to me about picking the platform or the way, you know, Like it's either a platform or um, kind of a vehicle of promoting. Like, for example, a podcast is a vehicle. So one of these other ways and platforms uh, is email marketing. And myself, I've been writing a weekly newsletter since 2008. In case you would like to receive mail from me on Saturdays, you can head on over to sarasanacroce.com forward slash newsletter. I'm always including some inspiration, reflection, and one or two suggestions regarding marketing, either my own or someone else's. And that's why I called it Sarah Suggests Saturdays. It's still one of the ways that I like to build relationships with my people. And the other way is, like I said, this podcast, it's my favorite way. And then also uh, soon uh, my book, that's also kind of a a platform or a way to, you know, engage with a new audience. So yeah, there's very different ways and many ways to promote your business and your services and who you are. But today I want to focus on email marketing. So I'm bringing you my favorite email marketing expert, Ian Brody. I always ask my guests to provide a bio in the podcast intake form that I can then read. And and as I always do here, kind of let you know who this person is that I'm uh, chatting with. And here's what the form said in that bio field. I genuinely don't have one. <laughs> it really made me uh, giggle. Now, Ian is not a beginner who just never got around to writing a bio. He's really a rookie in the online marketing world. And here's what it says on his about page. He begins with, so I should probably say right from the start that I really dislike long self-promotional about me pages that waffle on about great how great the person is or how they started from nothing to become a zillionaire. If you just pay them a bunch of money, you can do the same. <laughs> Sounds like he's our kind of guy, right? So I really... Um, thought about this and really like how he's doing things differently and doesn't care about the industry standard uh, to the point where he's like, I don't have a bio. 
there you go. You know, I'm going to be on a podcast, but I don't have a bio. So love it. So instead of learning about Ian from a boring bio, I suggest we just dive right in and you'll get to know who he is by listening. So without further ado, here's Ian Brody. Hey, Ian, so good to talk to you. How have you been? I have been fantastic. Well, as fantastic as one can be when you can't leave the house. (laughs) I know. Yeah, you guys are in serious lockdown. We're recording this January 13th. So yeah, same old, same old. Nothing's changed really, right? It feels like another Groundhog Day. Um, Hopefully people will listen to this in the future and think, what what was happening back then? How weird was that? Hopefully they won't won't be doing it as zombies are. are. (laughs) Oh, marauding over the over the over the land or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's true. It's like these podcasts stay, you know, stay forever. So who knows? Maybe 10 years Ooh. from now we'll be like, oh, remember that? Remember your red hoodie, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's good to talk to you. I'm looking forward to discussing this topic that is email marketing. And when I, before we hit record, I, I said, yeah, who do I know who knows how to talk about email marketing and, and a gentle approach to email, email marketing? And I was like, yeah, of course, my friend Ian. So talk to us about email marketing. I want to start with what, what you have on your website. And there's like this big title that you talk about value-based marketing. So tell us what you mean by that and and how that gets reflected in email marketing. How do we yeah, do value-based marketing? Okay, well, I guess it's worth starting by saying you know, value-based marketing isn't something I've kind of invented myself or plucked out of thin air, really. <laughs> it's more just putting a name to a collection of best practices that all seem to have a common theme, I guess, and then figuring out how they work, why they work, and then kind of improving on them and extending them. So value-based marketing really is just delivering value through your marketing. And when I say through your marketing, what I mean is that in your marketing, instead of your marketing being all about claiming that you'll be able to help someone or whatever it is your product does and make and uh, kind of promoting the product itself, and the marketing is all about promotion of something, value-based marketing says, well, let's make the marketing itself valuable and interesting and useful. And obviously value is in the eye of the beholder. So value could be by providing useful information. Value could be just by being really entertaining if it's a TV ad. So just to give you a couple of examples, here in the UK, we have a retailer called John Lewis. And John Lewis are really famous because every Christmas, they make a really famous Christmas TV ad. And it's always very touching and moving, great music, great story behind it. And Mm. people anticipate that advert. They look forward to that advert coming on the TV because people love it. They enjoy it. That's the value they get from the advert. So the advert is not not just all about promoting their, 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 their store. I mean, it does that more subtly. But the key thing is people look forward to it. People anticipate it. People will deliberately watch it. They'll share it on social media. They'll talk about it because they find it valuable. And the exact same thing applies in the kind of business-to-business world. I mean, a really classic example of that is back from the 60s and 70s. Probably everyone listening will know David Ogilvy and Ogilvy and Mather, the huge advertising agency. It's now called Ogilvy One. Back then, when Ogilvy wanted to drum up business for his advertising agency, they used to take out full-page adverts in the kind of newspapers and magazines that the executives in large companies would read. But instead of the advert you know, being a typical advert that would say, you know, where Ogilvy and Mather, you know, our clients get a 75% return on investment. Here's a whole bunch of testimonials. Here's how great we were. Mm -hmm. What they would do was they would make the adverts valuable. So they had um, an advert called How to Make Advertising Sell, which was their top 37 tips on successful advertising or how to launch a new product, which I think was about 16 tips on launching new products. And it was always like in-depth information um, and then the call to action was that, you know, contact them if you want to try this for yourself or you want us to do this for you, or if you want more information on it based on our experience. But the point was, you know, an executive in a, in a, in a large corporate would look at that advert and because it was useful, rather than just paging past the advert, as we do with almost all ads, they go, oh, that looks interesting. I'll, I'll read that. So they'd notice it more. They'd engage with it. They'd read it. They'd pay attention to it. Often they would cut it out of the magazine and put it away in their filing cabinet somewhere to use later. So the point was that through that type of valuable information in the advert, you got 
more attention, you build a bit of a relationship because people thought, oh, this is really good stuff. You build credibility. People could read from the the information Ogilvy and Mather were sharing that they really knew what they were talking about. And one of the key things is even if people weren't ready to buy right then, it had an impact on them. You know, they, they increased your credibility, increased your relationship, and often they would file it away. And then when they did need to launch a new product or run some advertising, they would come back to it. Whereas with traditional advertising, most people just flip past it because they were, if you're not ready to buy, you don't care about the, the testimonials of Ogilvy and Mather because you're not interested in getting advertising right now. You flip past it and you don't remember them and it does nothing for their credibility. And it, it only really works when someone is ready to buy. Value-based marketing works when people aren't ready to buy because it, it actually is something they look forward to, they want to see, they engage with. And really that's that's all value-based marketing is. Mm. Um, it, it sounds like there is so educational content, inspirational content. What else? En- entertaining content. Entertaining in content. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's the thing is often people will talk about content marketing, but mm-hmm. there's more ways of giving value than just through information. And also the key thing is value is different to information. A lot of content marketing I find is just people splurging out information that isn't really new that isn't really useful or valuable to people. It's just so they've done some content and it doesn't really have the impact that you're looking for because it's not perceived as valuable by your audience. That's really the starting point is to understand what they value and also understand what's persuasive to them, what what you need to do. And we'll come back to this later, I'm sure, but what you need to do for them to be ready to buy from you Mm -hmm. and getting that across. And the real art of it is marrying the value with the more sales side of it so that people are taking in the sales side of it without it jarring. So people will read the Ogilvy and Mather advert. And because of that, it builds their credibility. It builds trust. It builds a relationship because they see that you can really have a you know massive impact on the, the launch, the successful launch of a product. It builds desire for, for doing that, but it does it without it being kind of in your face and pushy. It does it by being helpful. But it could also be, as we saw with John Lewis, be entertaining as well. I think it was an advertising guy who was kind of a contemporary of Ogilvy, um, Bill Burnback, who's famous for, I think you've seen the, I'm sure everyone will have heard of the, the Avis advert, you know, where we're not number one, we're number two, so we try harder and that kind of thing. And mm-hmm. he did all the classic Volkswagen adverts, kind of almost made fun of a Volkswagen. And Burnback's philosophy, he was much more entertainment based, was that, you know, and, and he came about in an era where people were trying to use subliminal advertising and stuff like that. He said, look, this is all nonsense. People are intelligent. Give your audience credit for intelligence. And I'm paraphrasing him here. Give your audience credit for intelligence. They'll see through tricks to try and manipulate them. But if you just do something they enjoy and find useful and interesting and fun, then they'll lend you their ears enough for you to get your message across. And that's Mm -hmm. kind of what we're doing here. We're making something valuable. And in return, people are giving us their attention, which allows us to get our message across that we want them to get. So you're marrying the two together. It's not just sales message that's too in your face and people ignore. And it's not just useful information with no sales side to it. It's value and it's marketing put together. It's both and, yeah. It reminds me of some websites where, you know, they they invite you to uh, sign up for their newsletter but that's the exact wording they use. They uh, they they only tell you to sign up for their newsletter, but that's not really, you know, making me understand what the value behind this newsletter is. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's one of the it? yeah. that, that, that's a real, a real pitfall. Is and it's 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 a problem of I'm sure there's a scientific term for it. I forget, but but you know, as the as the 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 kind of the producer of the newsletter, just how valuable that newsletter is. Yeah. But, your potential readers don't know. So that's one of the reasons why we use value-based marketing. We don't claim, we don't say sign up for my newsletter and it'll be fantastic. (laughs) We usually, we put good content on the website that proves that the newsletter is going to be fantastic. Or of course, we give them something immediately valuable for free that that, that they get instant value from rather than just claiming value in the future. And that then gets them signed up for the newsletter or makes them want to sign up for the newsletter. Mm. Yeah, so talk, let's talk about this newsletter or or just in general, what we uh, also, the term that we also use is the list, right? It's mm-hmm. like the money is in the list and how do we grow that? It's all, it's all about the list all the time. So let's unpack that a little bit and maybe talk about, I think it's always good to start with the why. So why should we grow our list? You know, is there, why is that so important as entrepreneurs? And then maybe also 
I want to poke a little bit and say, well, is there a good reason not to? Like, mm. you know, could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those cases where all of the things being equal, then of course a bigger list is always more valuable. But the the thing is, things aren't always equal. So with with an email list, what you're looking to have on that email list is people who are good potential clients they are they you know they might want to buy what it is you're offering and you want to build credibility with those people so they think you know what you're talking about and you're the you know the right right person to help them out talking in a kind of services sense here because that's what I do and you've built some kind of relationship with them where they trust you they you th- they think you would be a good person to work with so if you can if let's say you had a thousand people on your email list and the average relationship score of you know or goodness score of how much people really need your services how credible you are with them and you know strength of your relationship let's say that was seven and you had a thousand people on the list if you doubled that to two thousand people on the list and it was still seven that's obviously good you've just got more people on there that still are the right kind of people on the other hand if you're adding people to the list who aren't actually potential clients for you who aren't you know on a good fit that's not going to help or if you're you know you're doing it in a way that actually damages your relationship with them and doesn't build your credibility you know you know you could very easily build an email list by offering free money but it would attract the wrong people <laughs> and it would do nothing to build your credibility and nothing to build trust with them so it would be a useless list Right. But that said, I think we have to, you know, have to be realistic here. If you if you had it you went from a thousand people to two thousand people, and let's say the average was seven, I was seeing before, and let's say the average went down to six with two thousand, I would probably say that six at two thousand is probably better than seven at a thousand because it's doubling. Three at two thousand would not be better at all, but 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 six is slightly better because you've got some sevens, you've got some eights, you've got you know, whatever. So you you I wouldn't say you have to absolutely have every new person on your email list is of the very highest quality because you just never know, really. That's one of the things when it's not like you're meeting them face to face and you have a discussion with them and you can tell whether they're a good prospect. Someone signs up on your email list, you're hoping they are, but you don't know a lot about them. So generally speaking, building a bigger email list is good as long as you build it in the right way by t- by attracting the right people and by building credibility building trust then that's a generally speaking is a good thing mm, yeah I, I, i'm thinking it also it depends also on yeah what you already said how you build that list so if you're just you know putting out ads and 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 then it attracts the, the wrong crowd then uh, yeah you're going to have a big big list but not a big high quality list. That's the first thing. The second thing is I really think also depends on what kind of business you have. Like if you only work with clients one-on-one, for example, and you know you don't have a team, well, maybe you're better off uh, using another marketing strategy rather than building these giant lists where yes. I, you know it's interesting i thought for a second you were going to say maybe it's better to have a small list but i would say you know so, sometimes email just isn't the right strategy as you just said yeah um, even though you know i wrote a book on email marketing i you think you have to recognize it's not always the right strategy for everyone right i mean usually usually with most businesses this kind of i i usually like to kind of group potential clients into, into i draw them on a pyramid and there's three levels and there's a top level that you might call a perfect 10, which is a very small number of super high value potential clients. Let's say if you were a consultant working on mergers and acquisitions, you might only work on two or three projects a year because each project is so big. Right. Um, so, and, and you might have a prospect pool of potential clients that might be a, a dozen, something like that. You don't really need an email list for that. Yeah. Um, what you need is personal relationships. Exactly. Um, now, underneath that, you might have like a group of 50, 100 or so who are not potentially such a high value. You might do, let's say you do group coaching programs with corporates and you might have a bunch of you know, 50, 100 potential corporates on that list. And you use fairly standardized, low tailored marketing for each of them. So you've got a group there. The, the lower list where you're trying to build a really big list tends to be where you have more standardized services that you do. There's two reasons. One is you have more standardized services you can do that they can build without needing a person, they can buy without needing a personal relationship with you, or where you want to bigger build a big pool of people who can then bubble up into the higher levels. So right. I have a client um, who actually actually reminded me of this because I initially said, look, 
If you want a small number of corporate clients, then just focus on these kind of personal tactics. If you want large number of of lower value clients, focus on these tactics. And she said, actually, though, Ian, you know, and from our work together, we focused a lot on the email side, and it built me a big pool of people in corporates who knew of me, and they also read my book, and it and it raised awareness of me that meant that some of the very high potential clients, the senior executives, they were, you know, those more junior people or whatever were talking to them about me. And so it was much easier for me to build personal relationships with those people at the top level because I'd also done the groundwork. But but it does kind of split, as you said, by and large, you know, if you, if you only want three clients a year, email marketing is probably not the most efficient solution for you. Right. I see I see what you were doing though. You almost used email marketing as a branding technique to to In that case, yeah. get get the word out there and and then and then yeah, they your email subscribers almost influence their bosses in order to to then get you and uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, the, some people who, you know, this is the world is never black or white. So typically you'll find that very senior executives in corporations, especially older ones, and things change over time, of course, but older ones are not browsing, you know, not searching the web all the time. They're not spending all their time on social media. So it's difficult to reach them through that, but some do. Some mm-hmm. senior executives will be, it could be on your e, but it would need to be a certain size before you'd have a good chance of a certain number of them being on. It's more likely to be the situation you said where maybe some of their reports. So you know how very often a senior executive in a large organization will have a couple of trusted advisors in maybe their head of strategy or a person they, they're grooming for success who's a couple of levels down, but is a rising star in the organization. And they're the kind of people who are more likely to be on an email list and be influenced and then pass the message up. Or of course, over time, they may, you know, they may become the more senior people. There's a, I, I used to get asked the question, True. what's the best, what's the best way of building relationships with um, senior executives? And I always used to say, build them with junior executives and wait. Um, <laughs> because, because it's a lot easier to get, you know, to, to build a relationship with someone who's not been crowded out by other people who hasn't got seven. Who doesn't have a secretary yet. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Catch yeah. them early and wait. So uh, <laughs> that was slightly joking, but it's also true. It's also it's true. true. A lot of the yeah. very best relationships are very long term and started off when both the advisor or you know the seller and the and the client were much more junior in their organizations and they kind of grew together right right all right so now that we know the why let's get to the how i'd like to have you talk about some specific examples how people can get more subscribers in in a way that feels good you know with integrity and and gentleness well i think it really comes back to what you said earlier about the thing not to do is not just to have a, you know, sign up for my newsletter. If you think about people um, who are on the web browsing or on social media, et cetera, there's a kind of immediacy to it. People are looking for a kind of instant payback. So saying to them, hey, sign up for my newsletter and maybe once a month in the future, you'll get something useful is not a big motivator to take action. Um, They want something they can do, something fairly quickly with. So usually it's a good idea, almost always it's a good idea to offer them something that offers an immediate payback, an immediate investment. Now, sometimes we call that a lead magnet or a freebie or whatever we want to call it, but it's something they can get immediately that involves signing up to get regular emails for you. And of course, you've got to be clear up front. This is what you know GDPR introduced, but really was good practice all along. Was you know, don't just say, hey, come and get my free report and then sneakily sign, you know, they start getting emails from you. You tell them up front, sign, sign up for my free report and get my regular weekly leadership tips or whatever it might be, or get my regular weekly leadership tips and get the your free report you can download straight away or whatever it is. So give them something big for free that's incredibly valuable. So that might be something that solves an immediate problem for them that you know is very common amongst your ideal clients or something that shows people their overall path to, you know, the roadmap for greatness or something that, you know, maybe a template or a, a quick checklist that would be useful for them right now with one of those one of those problems or roadmaps they have. So think about what the big problems and challenges and goals and aspirations of your ideal clients are. Think of something that could give them value immediately and then create that and offer it to them. And that's usually the most important thing. You see a lot of people with email marketing worrying about, you know, the design of the opt-in page and the opt-in form and should I be 
you know, offering this by Facebook ads or should, should it be on Google or should I be sharing it organically? But really the most important thing is having something incredibly valuable because if you've got something that people really want, you can get away with mediocre marketing and people will still want it and it'll, it'll work itself out. If you've got something that people aren't really all that interested in, all the, you know, all the brilliant marketing in the world is not going to get them to take it. So start off with that lead magnet and the characteristics of that lead magnet are, I think, threefold. One is obviously it should be, it should be something that's really attractive. It should draw people towards you. As I said, it should solve an immediate problem for them. It should be clear up front that it solves a problem. You, if you name it in the right way, you know, so I like to name things. If, if it's an overall map, I like to call it a blueprint or a roadmap because that sounds really valuable. If it's something really comprehensive, you might want to call it a Bible or an ultimate guide because that gives a sense of, oh, right, this is really meaty and useful. Um, so make it really valuable, but it's, you've got to deliver on that value as well. It's no good. And I'm sure we've all had this where we've seen something promoted. Oh, that sounds really useful. And you've signed up for it and you get it and you think, oh, right, that was it. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, It's no different to something you've already got. And you think, oh, right. And that's almost worse than not getting people to sign up for your list at all, because you've actually damaged your relationship with them. You've started off with them thinking, oh, this person has nothing new or useful to say. And you're probably going to lose them fairly quickly unless you can recover the situation. So make sure your lead magnet really does deliver on the promise. So there's a great promise there of something valuable, and it does deliver on that thing that's valuable. And then as we hinted at earlier, it's got to attract the right sort of people. It's got to attract the kind of people who you are looking to work with. So we made the kind of flippant observation that if you gave away free money, you get lots of people signing up, but it would be the wrong sort of person. But for example, if in your consulting or coaching or whatever work you do, you tend to work with people on big long-term projects, then maybe you want to think about your lead magnet showing them the the roadmap for that big long-term transformation because you want to attract people interested in transformation. If you do a big transformation stuff with clients, it's probably best not to just give them a little quick hit, an immediate win as a lead magnet, because it's going to attract people who want to get quick results, and you don't actually give them quick results. When you work with them, you're working with them for the big long-term stuff, or vice versa. You know, if you, if you tend to work with people to give them quick hits, you do a quick, short project, they get immediate results, don't do a lead magnet that attracts people who are looking for a long-term thing. Right. It has to be coherent with what you're actually wanting to sell. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And so that is, so what you're saying is it, it doesn't really matter so much how you are going to share it and promote it. What matters is that once people land on your website, they actually want that thing that you want to give away. Right? Yes. And once, and if you have something really valuable like that, it does some amazing things. So firstly, it means that people will naturally share it. Right. So, you know, you'll get some traction that way. It also means you will feel better about sharing it. So what one of the, th- you know, I am not, and I'm, sh- I'm sure most of the people listening w- are not the sort of people who feel comfortable, you know, knocking on doors, phoning up people and, and trying and tell them how great they are. It's just, mm. it's not in our nature, but I am reasonably happy if I've got a, a really valuable report that I, that I think people would benefit from, I am reasonably happy saying to someone, you know, let's say I, I met them face to face and they talked about a problem they had and I had a really useful report. I feel much better saying, you know what? I've actually written a short report about that. I think you might find helpful. Do you want me to send you a copy? I'd feel great about that. I would feel a bit uncomfortable saying, you know what? I'm really great. I can help you solve that problem. That would feel very salesy to me. And maybe I'm, I'm being foolish and I should say that, but it feels uncomfortable. But I don't feel uncomfortable at offering them something. Or if I've written a book, hey, I've, I've written a book on that. Would you like a copy, et cetera? And I can harness that through referrals. If I've written, you know, created, it doesn't have to be a report. It can be a video. It could be a webinar, whatever it might be. If I've got something great and valuable, I don't mind going out to people and, and saying, hey, you know, I noticed on LinkedIn, you're connected to Fred Smith of Big Corp. I think Fred might find this report I've written really useful. You know, how, how do you recommend I, I get it to him? So that all those kind of informal in-person ways work and you're much more able to do it if you're proud of what you've created. Then when it comes to those other strategies, you know, should I run adverts, et cetera, it really is dependent on where your audience is and also your preferences. You know, personally, I like writing and creating new stuff 
So what works for me mainly is creating content on my website that I think is really valuable, is very comprehensive. So I have some of the the biggest articles on any given topic in the fields of consulting and coaching, because that's what I like creating. And because I create it like that, people are very willing to share them and people and they do pretty well in Google. So if you search for the word corporate clients, for example, I'll usually be on first page, often number one in Google, because I've written a really big in-depth article about how to win corporate clients. So that kind of approach works for me. For other people, it might be Facebook ads. If their clients are on Facebook, it might be sharing content or doing video on LinkedIn, and then the occasional link back to your website for the sign up for them to get more from that really depends on your audience. And it changes over time as well. I mean, and 10 years ago, I used to use Facebook advertising a lot because it was really cheap and it was fairly easy to figure out. Nowadays, it's much more expensive and much more complex. <laughs> Not the sort of thing I would advise someone who you know hasn't, hasn't got any experience in it to, to jump into because you can spend a ton of money um, and get no results. Um, it goes very it. fast. Yeah. And, and yeah. you need to really be good at it in order yeah. to get the right kind of people to subscribe, right? Because of the, if you do the targeting wrong, then you might be first all happy. And, and I'm talking from experience here that <laughs> all these people are signing up and then you realize, well, nothing is happening after that because basically they're the wrong kind of people. Right? Absolutely. And if you're paying two, you know, 10 cents for someone to sign up, that's fine. If you're paying $5, that's really not so fine. Exactly. So it goes fast. Things change in that world. Now, these days for me, Facebook advertising, for example, is kind of like a second level thing that mm -hmm. either you have to dedicate a lot of time and decide you want to master it and it right. be in focus or you build your business to the, to the degree where you can afford to hire an expert. Uh, right. to do that for you. So there's nothing wrong with it, but it is a bit of a difficult and challenging one to start off with. It's it's the next step, basically, yeah. Yeah, if you want to take it further. Talking about next steps, the, the, once you have the person on your list, it, you give them you know, the free report or whatever you want to give away for free, but usually what then follows is the funnel. It's, there's that word that I, I'm not a big fan of. I actually invite my uh, gentle marketers to think of it more as a path. So we don't want to, you know, get our people to follow through this funnel that kind of feels like they don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So I look at it more as a path. And how how do you think about what comes after the sign up and what are kind of the best practices that you are sharing with your clients? Well, I think I think there's a kind of a, a a simple version and a, and a more advanced version. Simple version is not that simple, so but <laughs> I'll, uh, but it's not as advanced as the advanced version. So I'll start off with a simple version. And the simple version is really, firstly, just to recognize that for most of us, the vast majority of the people who sign up will not be ready to buy from you straight away. Right. They've got to go on a journey with you. And that journey will involve a variety of steps and where you're building credibility, you're building trust, and they're building desire to, to buy whatever it is you have that solves a problem for them or helps them achieve a goal. So recognize that right away, they are not in a position where they are ready to buy. So the first thing I would do is just say to people, write down what, what is it going to take for them to be ready to buy? For your typical ideal client, just get down a piece of paper and say, what needs to be in place? And I'm thinking here in terms of beliefs and attitudes and knowledge of that person. What do they need to believe to be ready to buy? So for uh, there's you know there are a lot of common factors in there. So obviously before someone's going to buy something of any any significance, they're usually going to have to believe they've got a big problem that needs solving and it's fairly urgent. That will be one belief. They probably have to believe that you have a great solution for this and it really works. If they've got any experience, they probably tried to solve this. But if you're a leadership coach, for example it's very unlikely that your potential clients have never had any kind of leadership training or coaching before. Undoubtedly, they have. And if they need to buy more, it's probably because the previous stuff didn't work. So they probably have to believe that your stuff is different to what they've tried before and therefore might work for them. If they're going to work with you in a service business, they probably have to believe they would enjoy working with you. You'd be a good person to work with, that kind of thing. So if you write down those kind of beliefs... With your email marketing, your follow-up, it's your job to instill those beliefs in them over time. However, 
you can't just do it by stating them. You know, nobody's going to tune into a series of emails where email one says, hey, you've got a really big problem. Email two says, guess what? I've got a fantastic solution that always works. Here's some testimonials. <laughs> and email three says, I'm lovely to work with as well. Come and, come and join me. People are not going to be tuning in for that email. So the, this is where we go back to value-based marketing. You've got to start by thinking of, well, what value can I give them? So I want to try and make every email valuable to them. So I'm going to put aside all those beliefs I need to establish for, for a moment and just say, what would be valuable to this potential client I have? And usually value means, you know, information and advice, anything useful to them that helps them solve a problem or achieve a big goal. So think, so first think through what are the big goals and problems and challenges, aspirations of my ideal clients. And then think, through, well, how, what, what, what can I send them that will be useful and valuable for them that helps them with those? And that once you've got that and you can kind of write those down and maybe sequence them in order to group them together into similar things, et cetera, that kind of gives you a sequence of, of value-based emails. But then you tie the two together. So then you say, well, okay, how can I get that value across but illustrate it in a way that proves one of those beliefs that I want them to have so just to, to, to kind of illustrate that with an example, let, let's say you were a LinkedIn trainer and you might have a, va a really valuable email, which is 10 tips about improving your LinkedIn profile. And you could do a really simple version, but there's nothing wrong with an email that says, here are 10 things, you know, one, do this, two, do this, et cetera, 10 tips on improving your LinkedIn profile. And that's going to be great. And people are going to get value from it. And it's going to help your relationship and build a bit of credibility, but you can do a little bit more. How about instead of just doing the, you know, 10 tips in a list, you explain those same 10 tips, but as a case study of a client you worked with who followed those tips and as a result got a new job or got a client or whatever they got as a result of having an improved profile. So by wrapping the, the tips in a story that's a case study, you're, you're allowing the client to tick off, oh, right, so Ian's worked with people who seem to be just like me and they've got great results. Tick. And and you've, you've begun to establish that belief. So, so – if it was, if you were just saying, "Hey, guess what? I've worked with people just like you, and they get great results," nobody's going to read that or believe you. Nobody's going to believe that because everyone would say that. But right. if you use that as a story or an example, a case study to illustrate a valuable information you're giving them, then two things happen. One is the value means they're interested in it; they they appreciate the email you've sent. But secondly, the the information about you know, you being great to work with, you having success with clients kind of gets in under the radar. You're not ramming it down people's faces. It's a bit like a magician. You know, if a magician appears on stage and says, I have in my hands a perfectly ordinary pack of cards, nobody in the audience <laughs> believes that that's a perfectly ordinary pack of cards. Hmm. On the other hand, if the magician says, hey, I want to do a quick trick and then just without even looking says, hey, and hands the pack of cards to someone in the audience. Do you mind shuffling this pack of cards? And the audience member shuffles it and the, and the guy goes, oh, thanks, that's great. And then proceeds with the trick you then think, oh, right, the audience member shuffled it. That must be an ordinary deck of cards. Now, most likely it's not. There are plenty of ways you can gaff up a deck of cards so that an audience member is not going to notice when they shuffle it. But nonetheless, we've kind of subtly, because you haven't said, because you've illustrated that it's an ordinary deck of cards by getting someone to, uh, to shuffle it, people believe it more. And th so it's that kind of marrying of start with value, what, what are valuable emails I can send? And then how, through those emails, through illustrations or other ways of doing it, through maybe a subtle fact or figure. So, for example, if you want to prove that this is a big problem, then when you introduce your email talking with some tips on it, you maybe give some statistics about how big the issue is for, from a recent survey or something like that. That just makes people sit back and think, oh, that's bigger than I thought. Maybe I ought to look into this. Maybe it's maybe it's something we should be working on. So you're just kind of mixing the two together. And yeah. if you repeat that over time, then what happens is people get great value from you. So they keep reading your emails. Plus, gently over time, people are getting to know a great person to work with. They're getting to realize this could be a big problem they need to solve. They're seeing you know what you're talking about, that you work and get great results with clients. All the things you want them to believe are coming in over time. But it's not like so in their face that they're, di they're disconnecting from your emails. Yeah, I like that. And what I would add is, is you know, for this gentle marketing approach, what, what I kind of talk about is there's almost too much focus on the problem sometimes. We've, we're taught to, you know, start with the problem. And that's fine as long as we don't kind of put a knife in people's back and say, <laughs> 
oh my God, your life is going to end if you don't solve this. But like, that's the kind of marketing we are sometimes exposed to. The, the pushy marketing just makes us believe like this problem is going to be the end for us. And, and so I'm saying address the problem because that's how people recognize yes. that you are the person that they need to speak to. And, and then from there, move on and, you know, kind of go into a more positive tone. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I do. I mean, I think there's no doubt that psychologically people pay more attention to problems. So, but, but having said that, I think a couple of things. One is I think you can definitely go too far. You can twist the knife so much yeah. that that you actually, you know, people just think there's no answer. There's no solution. I might as well give up sort of thing. Right. But I think probably more importantly, I think I've been thinking about this a lot recently with events in the world, et cetera. And I think in marketing, we, we kind of have a moral duty to not make the world a worse place. Exactly. And I think the if you do the, take that approach of, you know, really – essentially taking people and making them deliberately feel dissatisfied with their life. You know, and, and another another thing, another common tactic is to set up a common enemy and to throw rocks at the common enemy and mm. use division mm. and envy. Mm. And people are, the government are trying to take your money away from you. There's mm. these terrible competitors who are untrustworthy and they're stealing your mm. customers. And that works, but I think it, it makes the world a worse place. And it's that kind of marketing that's got us to, to to certain bad things that are happening in the world at the minute. You know, deliberately driving divisions between people in order to to that works for you because it meets your own ends, but it really doesn't help the world in general. And I think we've got a higher duty to try and market in ways that makes the world a better place, as well as, of course, meeting our goals of selling our products and services. I think we have a duty to try and do it in a way that, that's better for our clients and better for the world. And I would definitely, I would definitely agree with that. I don't, I wouldn't spend, you know, you have to talk about the problem, otherwise people don't realize it's an issue for them. So they'd never get to solve it. But I don't think you need to exaggerate and prod and poke. I think you remind people of it. And they go, yeah, you're right. Of course, it's a big problem. And then you move on to talking about, the, you know, the solution, the answer, etc. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking of this great quote that slips my mind right now, but I'll put it in the show notes. It basically goes along the lines of marketers of the 20th centuries are should be considered as healers. So us as marketers, we should be considered uh, healers. And, and that's, you know, kind of what you said, we have this role to play. And the role is not to just sell more in, you know, at the expense of whatever suffering there is, but, but we can, it's a, it's a both and situation again. Mm. It's like, yes, we can, you know, sell, but it, but not in a way that makes the world a worse place. And I think yeah. you, and you, and you know what, one of the advantages I think we have is I mean, most of us, I'm sure listening to this will work in smaller businesses. And, you know, if you're not IBM or you're not Coca-Cola, you don't need to sell to everyone. You right. don't need everyone to buy your product. There are enough people willing to buy when marketed to in a good way like this, that we can have, you know, brilliant businesses. We don't need, to go to the extremes in order to pe make people feel more worried than really they should be in order for them to buy our products. It's just not necessary in our kinds of businesses. And would you also agree in that a lot of times kind of we get lured into this idea of going big and, you know, we have to get as much people as possible onto our list. But what you just said is like, no, it doesn't have to be because you are talking to very specific people who are your people. And so you don't actually, yeah, you, you shouldn't feel like you should be following all these things that marketers tell you. Yeah, absolutely. I think you part of your own path. There's, there is a kind of amoral what is the most effective, and you can look at that and then think, is that something I want to do myself? Yeah. And if you don't feel good about it, you don't have to do it. You can still succeed with other methods. You don't have to use the most efficient method or the most effective method of doing everything. And as I think we're alluding to, sometimes that what looks like the most effective method that other people are using doesn't work for you 
anyway. And particularly, again, what, what, if you're talking about the difference between high value clients and smaller number and, you know, larger number of lower value clients, not that there's anything wrong with those, but different industries as well. You know what? I, I, I wrote an article ages ago. I think it was something along the lines of, you, you know, you get, the, you get the clients you deserve. No, you get the clients your marketing deserves. And mm-hmm. a lot of it is tempting to look at the way other people are marketing and to assume they're being successful and to think, well, if I want to succeed, especially if you're not doing so well at the time, to assume that because they're, you think they're successful, you don't know that they are really, but you think they're successful and they use market, you're using marketing that makes you feel a bit icky, mm-hmm. but to assume that you have to do that too in order to be successful. And it's not true. And in particular, you know, in this thing about getting the, the clients your marketing deserves, one example would be really outlandish claims. You know, you can quadruple your business in six weeks with no work whatsoever. And you, and you look at that and you think, oh, uh, no wonder they're getting clients and I'm not because they're, you know, they're kind of lying and seeing such a bold claim. But who is that going to attract? Realistically, there are only two sorts of people who are going to look at someone saying triple, quadruple your business in six weeks with no work and, and say, yes, I'll buy that. One is people who are so naive the they've you know they have no experience in business and they're kind of fresh 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 to the world and they go oh that would be lovely and they've ne- they've never realized that there are people out there that who may not be telling the truth or that it's really not that easy so there's people who are really naive and brand new and the other people is people who are desperate mm-hmm. you know if you are really desperate and you have no other choice and let let's say you have to you know your house is being taken away from you next week you need to kind of go to the casino and spin the wheel even though it makes no sense and it's not rational it's your only chance is, is a huge win. So if you say to them, you know what, I can increase your business by 50% in six months working steadily at that, that might not be enough for them. So they're forced to go down the road, even though they know this is a ridiculous claim and there's a 99% chance it won't work. They, they almost, they're so desperate they go down it. But those are not the clients we want. Most of us do not want to work with the naive and the fresh and, and, the, and the desperate. Most of us want to work with normal people, good people. And so I think if, you, if you're if you marketing, you know, if you see marketing that is extreme and you're thinking, well, it seems to be working for them, well, A, it might not be working, but B, it might be working, but attracting awful people to work with. Yeah. So, so the moral of the story is really like, look at the best practices, listen to, you know, what we shared here, what you shared here, Ian, and then see what works for you. And maybe that means, you know, some of the best practices work for you, but maybe you tweak them a little bit. You know, mm. you, you, yeah, I, I always tell gentle marketers dare to be different, you know, it, it, and, and I like, you know, I'm very programmatic as well. So there are certain things that we just know they work. So we know that, you know, the lead magnet uh, needs to be, contain a lot of value. So that I think, you know, the like common sense, but then yeah. how you're going to do the follow-up and, and, and everything else. Yeah. Use your creativity as well. And you can, you can add things to make it feel good for you. I mean, I think a good yeah. a simple example would be what one thing that vaguely annoys me. I shouldn't, but it does is, People people share things on social media like LinkedIn or Facebook, and then they say something like, you know, comment yes, and I'll send you a copy. Uh-huh, yeah. uh, and, and 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 we, you and I know that the purpose of that is they want if people comment yes, it increases the visibility and the engagement on the post, so Facebook shares it more. Right. And the people who are doing using that technique are kind of pretending comment yes, so I know that you're interested or whatever. But really, they just want engagement on the post to make it go more widely. So you can look at that and say, well, that technique is effective, but how can I make it feel better for me? How about if I'm just honest? How about if I say comment yes on this post um, and I'll send you a copy and then say, and also, of course, it will give gain more visibility v- visibility of the post so I get to share with more people. Yeah. So be honest about what you're doing. You don't have to hide and protect. And so, that, but I mean, that's just an example, but it's an example of taking a, a marketing technique that seems to work, but you maybe feel a little bit icky about, and then just saying, well, what could I do to it to make it work for me that I wouldn't feel icky? And very often, it, you know, with some of these things, it's about being honest. And in, in everything, in everything yeah. we do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So true. I think this is a this is a good place to come full circle. Honesty is is like this great, you know, kind of overarching theme around marketing. If we can mm. 
just be honest in every communication we send out, I think, yeah, we can only win. You, you know, I, I had a discussion on Facebook years ago with a guy who, who did um, talks on philosophy. And we were, we were talking about, you know, marketing versus manipulation, all that kind of stuff, a debate you often get into when it, there's no, there's all bits of gray and it's all, you know, some people say it, it's up to you to market as hard as possible, as long as you believe in your product. But then I think there are plenty of people who believe in their product and their product is a whole lot of rubbish. You know, you, can, you can't just be, rely on that. Right. And what, what this guy said, which I've always followed to this day, he said, look, with any marketing, always ask yourself the question, if the if the client, if the recipient of the marketing knew what I was doing, how would they feel about it? Mm. Would they feel like they were being manipulated or would they go, yeah, that's fair enough? Right. So, you know, with your marketing, for example, why do we use social proof? We use social proof because we know that, you know, if, if people see that other people are using a product, that you kind of you feel it must be safer, it must be good because other people are using it. So if you use social proof on, on, on your website, probably the people reading it don't know that that's the case. But if you said to them, you know what, if they said, well, why did you? Why have you got the logos of big companies there? And you say, that's because by seeing those logos, you feel more comfortable and you feel that you know this, this product is, it must be a good one. They'll go, oh yeah, fair enough, that's probably true. They don't feel cheated. Right. If you understand how it's working behind the scenes. You On the treat other hand, them like smart people. Right? Yes. Going back yeah. to that quote, treat yeah. them like intelligent people. You don't yeah. have to, underneath your testimonials on the webpage, write, the only reason I'm showing you this is to make you feel like you don't have to rub their face in it. No. The important point is, if they asked you about it and you told them the truth about why you were doing something in your marketing, if they would be upset or cross about it, then don't do it. If you think they would go, oh, that's fine. Oh, that's great. I'm ha- quite happy with that. Then that's it. Then that's, you know, good marketing to do. Right. Ian, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. Do you tell people where they can find you and your great lead magnet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If they just come to www.ianbrody.com, they can find the value based marketing blueprint on the very front page to sign up for that. And that's quite a big document and it covers all the steps in value-based marketing, right from why we're doing it to how to build it into every step. One of the keys to value-based marketing is I think we all, we all do a little bit of it, but we do it inconsistently. So we might give away a free report, sign up for emails, but then we spam people with sales pitches afterwards. And it's like, no, it's got to be all of your marketing. Of course, you that's an aspiration. You can't do it every single email you send, for example, but by and large, your first, a bit like Google is trying to get everyone to go mobile first. I think for, for emails or any marketing, you're doing value first. The first thing to think about is in this piece of marketing, how can I make it valuable for my audience? And then think about, well, now how can I make it sell as well? How can I make it effective as well? But start with value and the value-based marketing blueprint will teach you how to do that. Awesome. So ianbrody.com, you'll find that. Thanks so much, Ian. This has been amazing. Thank you for Fantastic. coming on. Didn't talk much about email, but I think we talked about a lot of good stuff. <laughs> we did. <laughs> I'll, you'll have to come back maybe. Oh. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation and took maybe some notes in order to implement some of these tips into your own email marketing. To find out more about Ian, go check out his website at ianbrody.com. That's I-A-N-B-R-O-D-I-E.com. And there you can also download his value-based marketing blueprint, or you can go directly to ianbrody.com forward slash VBM dash blueprint. You'll find the show notes of this podcast with further links at sarasonacroche.com GBR72. Also, our next Gentle Business Circle is coming up, yay, on February 10th. And if your intuition tells you that now, in 2021, is the time to join our monthly explorations of gentle marketing, we'd love to have you. We are now a little group of over 20 people, all gentle marketers, And besides the main group, we also get to share and hear each other's perspective in the smaller breakout rooms. You can find out more and sign up at sarasanacroche.com forward slash circle and choose the monthly price that feels good to you and suits your current budget. Next Friday, I have a beautiful conversation lined up about partnering with the world with Jane Warlow. 
And then the following week is a very special week here on the Gentle Business Revolution podcast. We're celebrating the International Random Acts of Kindness Week and my official book launch with a daily episode around the topic of kindness in business. And on Wednesday, February 17th, you're kindly invited to join me for the book birthing party where my friend Kat Rose will interview me on the book. And you also get to ask questions. So this is like an open Zoom call and whoever joins me, uh, you know, we, we hang out. So I would absolutely love to see you. You can sign up at sarasanacroce.com forward slash party. And in the meantime... Let's be the change we want to see in the world. Speak soon.